in case you're wondering, all the accidents that will happen tonight are not planned. <laughs> it's every time. Everybody help us out.
Well, good evening, and welcome to Franklin Baptist Church. Wow, what a crowd. Welcome to the Eastern Henry County Round Robin Revival. That's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> we have been looking forward to this for a long, long time. Back in early summer, Paul and uh, Joey and I and Steve Douglas met for a meeting to talk about something totally different. And this idea came up, and uh, we liked it. And so Jamie met with uh, Paul and Joey later on in the summer, and they put this together, and it came to fruition, and here it is. And uh, we've been praying about it, and we've been looking forward to it. And thank you for being here for the first night of Revival. And Paul's going to bring us a message here in a few minutes. Tomorrow night we move to Union. And then Friday night, we move to Lockport. And we hope that you'll be present each and every night because God's got something special for us every night. And uh, bring somebody with you, uh, especially somebody who may not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, a neighbor, a friend, a family member. Invite them to come with you because God's got something special for them. And they need to hear these messages each night. But we're glad you're here tonight. Uh, we welcome you to Franklinton. And uh, if the, one of the most important things to know in every church is where's the bathroom, right? So the bathroom is down the hall at the very end of the hall on the left. So if Paul gets to preach too long tonight and you just have to go to a bathroom, that's where it is. And if you can't get out and make it down the hall, go out this door. And there's plenty of bushes out back, okay? So any way you want to go, you'll find a bathroom. But we are glad you're here, and we welcome you to Franklinton. Now, each night we're going to take up an offering. And um, you're not paying the preachers. Don't, it's not going for preachers. But we are going to support Eastern Elementary School. The churches have been doing some special things for Eastern, and we're going to continue to do that. And this is what we're going to do. Eastern take, takes up, they give gift cards. When kids need something uh, specific, maybe some shoes or a jacket or maybe some food, they give out gift cards to the uh, Dollar General store. And the Dollar General store keeps track of what is spent there. They can't use it for cigarettes or anything except what they send that family to the Dollar General store for. So if Eastern sends them to the Dollar General store to buy a pair of shoes or a jacket or a specific type of food, the Dollar General store keeps track of that. So we're taking up money here tonight, tomorrow night at Union, Friday night at Lockport, to buy gift cards for, or to, to give to Eastern so they can buy the gift cards. And the back of the church is a box that says... Uh, about for an offering. So when you leave tonight, if you'd like to put money in that box, tomorrow night at Union, Friday night at Lockport, uh, Gene, hold that box up. It's back there in the back. It's a wooden box. So if you'd like to contribute, please do so. If you're going to write a check tonight, we'll make it to Franklinton, okay? But if you just drop a few dollars in there, then we can take that money and help out Eastern Elementary School, our school here on, in the Eastern Henry County. Got it? All right. That's all the announcements I have, but we are so happy that you're here. Now, we have a tradition here at Franklinton that we welcome each other every Sunday morning. So I'm going to ask you to stand up, find somebody you don't know, and shake their hand and tell them you're glad to see them here.
All right, all right. That's enough. Simmer down. <laughs> Debbie, you did good, sweetie. Thank you. Everybody smile and say cheese. <laughs> I can't believe y'all actually did it. Well, we got a couple of more songs to do before you all get to sing. Did y'all know you get to sing tonight? Did y'all know you get to sing tonight? There we go. I know it's dark out, and I'm sleepy when it gets dark out. But Ronnie, you're at the end of the service. You and Jackie. Elvira, right? That's yeah. First, I need Jenny, Amy, and Chad to come up here. Oh, boy. No, I'd be you. Yeah. Now, we rehearsed this once, so. But it was so pleasing. You and Chad, yeah. Move that you and Chad. Me and Chad. This one right over here. Okay. <laughs> Just don't be. Yeah, try to control yourselves, okay? Exactly. Yeah. Why start why start now? All right. And you're right, white. <laughs> so much. I always said that if you're going to be a singer, the best thing you can do is go to church and sing in front of church people because it is a boot camp for singers because when I looked down and I looked up, y'all was doing this. Felt a little scary, but.
but that's all right. I understand. Cannot tell you how much I've been looking forward to this personally since we talked about it. We have been excited, and I think there is a fire for God started in this county. And we're here to take care of each other. And I can't thank Paul and Joey and Jackie and everybody for everything that went into putting everything together this week. I'm really excited to see it. Jackie, are you ready to sing? I'm just teasing. Don't leave. <laughs> Y'all stay right where you're at. Thank my son, Grayson Tingle, back here for uh, working our audio and video stuff tonight. Appreciate it, boy. Don't ask for nothing. Yeah, uh, you know, if it don't play, I'll play it. It's not going to. That's fine. We'll do it this way. I told you all everything was supposed to explain to you. It wasn't. Now, if I break the screen, I'm going to knock it off. I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. Bill Hedges, if you get to feeling froggy, you can step up here with me, buddy. You and Phyllis both. It's closer now than in seven. I can almost hear the trumpet. the midnight cry when Jesus comes again well I look around me I see prophecies fulfilling and the signs of the time
chain Let the midnight cry When Jesus comes again And then those that remain They'll be quickly changed Y'all right on time. Did a good job. <laughs> we ask now to please, oh, we're going to do hymns first. I don't have the order of service in front of me. It's like this every Sunday morning, and why should it be any different on a Wednesday? Won't you stand? You don't have to look in your hymnals if you don't want to. They will magically appear on the big screen TV. Ah. Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning and his precious blood's atoning. And I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his mansion he has built for me in glory. And he handed out the streets of gold. Beyond the crystal sea, about the angel singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there a song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing. Wow. <laughs> Remain... Don't sit down yet. I'm an emotional dude sometimes, especially when I walk in here. But if you could have been standing where I'm standing and heard what I heard, it hit like a Mack truck. Son. Whew -wee. Mercy. That's yeah. Like I, I got goosebumps. When we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, 
will sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Now with no music. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. We now ask that you prepare your hearts for worship like they ain't prepared yet. Oh, but Miss, Miss Kathy and Miss Becky are going to play for us, and we ask that you prepare your hearts for worship and what God has laid on Paul Briscoe's heart, Reverend Paul, tonight. Well, we've done our part, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of well, I ain't got to introduce him, do I? Everybody knows. I think we probably related to Halfless County anyway. Uh, Paul's been in Lockport since 2008. Is that right? Don't stand there. Yes, I was going to say, you better know. <laughs> 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Paul Briscoe. Well, then it was on him. <laughs> but we as pastors have a responsibility to proclaim the gospel and to do it accordingly, and we have to protect the pulpit that which we guard. And so, Brother Jackie, thank you for allowing me to stand here tonight. And I promise you, I am not long-winded. I believe the heart will only receive what the butt will endure. So I will get <laughs> us out of here as soon as we can. If you will, turn with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I tell you what, we're already blessed tonight, and the reason why we're blessed is, as Brother Jackie, Joey, and Jamie and me, we have 
a wager going on that who was going to start the first fight over the back pews in the church. And I heard that some of you already lost your back pew because the visitors got in. Well, at Lockport, they've asked me if they can come at noon on Friday to be sure they get their back seat. So, so I know how valuable that space is in any church. But thank you all for being here and, and allowing me to preach the Word of God. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Word of God says there, starting in verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, excuse me, first of all that which have also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on that third day according to the scriptures, and he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve, and after that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, and after that he was seen of James and all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due time, for I am, Paul speaking of himself, the least of the apostles that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But I love this next verse. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which He bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly that they that are yet not I, but that the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it I or they, so we preach, and so we believe. So it reads down to verse 58. Let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time to gather in your house with God's people. And I pray that tonight that your spirit will move freely in this congregation, bound every demon in hell, and allow your spirit to move, lead hearts to repentance unto salvation, hearts to rededication, lives, Lord, to lay burdens at this altar. But God, whatever it is, I pray that you get all the glory. And Lord, we love you, we thank you, and Lord, we're excited for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This, mor this, this morning, I tell you what, it's easy to do, ain't it? <laughs> this evening, the title of my message is Good News. And when I say good news, I'm talking about the gospel as being the good news. I believe that the gospel is the foundation in which we stand upon in the church today. I believe that anything else we do outside of this gospel is not according to the will of the Lord. There are theologies out there right now that believe that I believe the Bible, but I also believe the Spirit in my heart. And if the Spirit in my heart is contrary to this written word, I will believe the Spirit in my heart over the written word. That scares the socks off of me. And the reason why it scares the socks off of me is because the Word of God says in 1 John chapter 4 and 1, John says there that we are to try the spirits of God. How else are we able to try the spirit that's in our heart? Not by goose pimples, not by the warm and fuzzies we get in our belly, but by the Word of God of God. And so what I want to talk about tonight is what was happening here in this passage of scripture is Paul is writing this letter back to those in Corinth. In doing so, there was some false teachings, false preaching that was going on. What was happening, there was a lot of Greek influence in this early church. And in that, the Greeks did not believe in the miraculous. What I mean by that, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They believed in Jesus, they believed all that, but they did not believe that Christ was resurrected from the dead. And that theology was creeping into the believers in the church. And so Paul wrote this letter to confront that conspiracy. And he said unto them, he said, that's not the gospel. That's not good news. The good news is Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ was raised from the dead on that third day. That's the good news that sets us free, church. And you know something? It gets better than that. The good news is, is I believe that the Spirit of God is in this building tonight with us. Amen? And so I say that because I want to emphasize to you that what Paul says here in verse 2, he said, listen, if you don't believe this gospel, if you don't believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he says, your faith 
is in vain. I don't know about you, my faith is not in vain. It's grounded on the knowledge of knowing is Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, and I've got everlasting life because of what Christ has done for me. So what I want to do is I want to talk about what makes the gospel the good news. And there's just a few points I want to hit on. The first point is this. It is good news this evening that the gospel is because Christ died for us. Look where the Word of God says there in verse 3. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. It has been said before that the distance between heaven and hell is approximately 18 inches. The reason why they say it's 18 inches is because that's the span on the average person's brain to their heart. The emphasis is that you don't go to heaven because of your intelligence. You go to heaven for a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not all up here. It's not all here. It's all coming together for Christ. Now, the Bible says over in the book of James chapter 2, he speaks of a dead faith. That's a faith of someone who believes that they're going to go to heaven on falseness. And the falseness that so often implodes us is people think that they do a religious act, a religious service, and that's what's going to get them into everlasting life with the Lord. It doesn't work that way. One of the greatest examples we have in the Word of God of somebody who believed that was Judas Iscariot. You remember Judas, one of the 12 disciples? You remember that if you was to line him up with all the other disciples and you were to say, pick out to me the one that is false, no one would have choose him because of the Lord's Last Supper. You realize no one spoke up and said it's Judas Iscariot. He looked the part, talked the part, acted the part, but inside he was dead. And what's miraculous about that? You realize the sermons that that man heard? He heard Jesus preach. That's not Billy Graham preaching. Jesus preached. He saw the miracle that Christ performed. He saw the, the blind receive their sight, the lepers being cleansed. He saw those Lazarus coming back from the dead. He seen all that. But he didn't have a relationship with Christ. Church, there's a lot of people. A lot of people believe that you're going to go to heaven because you've walked an aisle or you've been baptized in a Baptist church. I have people come to me all the time and say, Preacher, I need to get baptized. Why? You dirty? Baptism doesn't do nothing but get you wet. It's the first act of obedience in Christ Jesus. That's what baptism is. It does not save you. I hear little people says this. They believe that they're going to go to heaven because they're a member of the church. Brother Jackie, Joey, I don't know about you all. We have 250 people on our church roll, Lockport Baptist Church. I can tell you on Sunday morning, we'll have nowhere near 250 people worshiping with us. The FBI and the CIA couldn't find half of them. They're gone in the wind. They've disappeared. That doesn't save you. And hear me good. If you don't hear nothing else I say, and I want you to hear this. Being a good person don't get you into heaven. You can be the type of person that will give me the shirt off your back and the last dollar in your pocket, but that does not gain you access to a holy God. The Word of God says your good work and acts and deeds are nothing more but a filthy rag to a holy God. You gain access to a holy God by receiving the Jesus Christ into your heart. It's a relationship that you have with Jesus. And the Word says is it comes by the according to the Scriptures. Look what he says there in verse 3. It says, For Christ died for our sins to what? According to the Scripture. Man, that's my the gospel good. That's what makes it good news is because we know that it's true and it's just. You want to know what isn't true? The news. You want to know what's bad? The news. If you go home, I tell my folks this all the time, it's a nausea. If you go home and you watch Fox News all day long, I guarantee you, you're going to want to take a ball back to a Democrat by the end of the day. If you listen to CNN all day long, you're going to want to push a Republican off a cliff somewhere because all it is is decisiveness. It, it, it's, it's all they're trying to do is build up strife. We've got the gospel. We've got the good news of Jesus Christ that sets us free. You know what that good news tells me is? John says, Jesus says in John 10, verse 10, he says, I came not only to give you life, but to give you life more abundantly. That's the Jesus we serve. That's the news he wants to give us. So why? Jamie Kidd on a moment ago, why is it that we gather in God's house on God's day and we look miserable? 
my wife and her family in her grandmother's house, they have a bunch of pictures from the 1800s, early 1900s of their family. And it's amazing to have that type of history and, and what they have there on that wall. But I always find it fascinating whenever you look at the pictures from the 1800s and the 1900s, have you ever noticed what they always look like in those pictures? <laughs> they look like somebody just beat their dog, right? They're miserable, and I don't know it's because they didn't have air conditioning, didn't have direct TV, or what it was, but they were miserable in those pictures. Now, why is it that we got the good news, and we come to God's house on God's day, and yet we don't act like we got the good news? We look miserable when we come to the Lord's house. Do you understand that the majority of the people in this area is unchurched? The majority of our nation is unchurched. When I say unchurched, I'm talking about they didn't grow up going to Bible school. They didn't grow up going to BBS. You ask them to turn to John 3.16, they don't know what John 3.16 is. They're completely unchurched. But you know something? They drive by Franklin Baptist Church every day. Whether they're going back and forth to work or to school. They go by Union. They go by Lockport. They go by our churches. And you know, the Spirit of God, He still moves and He still works. Even though they don't believe in Him, God believes in them. He wants to save them. And the Spirit of God gets on their heart, man. Start tugging at them. Saying, man, won't you try that church this Sunday morning? Won't you show up at church? I, I was born Baptist. I was raised a Baptist. I've been a Baptist preacher for 23 years. Okay? I still come to Baptist churches and get scared walking through those doors. Right? We mean. We mean looking. We ain't very nice. And you understand that this visit, you understand how hard that is to be unchurched, never walk through the door of Franklin Baptist Church, but on Sunday morning, God's speaking to your heart, and you get up and you say, I'm going to go to church today. And they walk in that door. And you know what you do? You give them the stink eyes, which you do. I've seen it a hundred times. You know what the stink eyes The stink eyes is you're sitting there in your pew, and you see somebody in the corner of your eye, and you look at them and you're like, who's that? <laughs> they ain't never been here before. Who is that? And then as they mosey through the church, you're like, well, I hope they don't sit in the wrong seat. Because you know why? I don't care how unchurched they are. They have heard the horror stories of Baptist folk kicking people out for sitting in assigned pews. They've heard these stories. And the fact of the matter is these stories are true. And, you know, some Baptist folk, they like to mark their territories. You ever seen them do that before? These are the people who put their little pillows with the praying hands in their spot. Or maybe the, the shawl. They put the shawl over. That, that's saying, hey, off limits, baby. Don't sit here. Don't sit here. And so they know not to sit in those pews. You know, they know that. But, you know, this wide open one. They, they don't know that Aunt Sissy has sit there for 35 years. They don't know Aunt Sissy. So they go over and they sit their blessed assurance down in that pew, scared to death. <laughs> Wondering, is there going to Baptist going to come up and kick me out? Are they going to ruffle me up? What, what's going to happen here? And Lord, help us. Lord, help us if you walk up to them and tell them to move over or to scoot over or to get out of the way. That's what they do. And then they worship with us. We sing victory in Jesus. They don't see no victory in Jesus. When we sing that song, man, we just stand there looking like we're dead to the world. And you know what happens when they leave? They think to themselves, says, Lord, I'm not coming back to that church because I don't want to catch what they got, all right? They don't want no part of it. We have the joy of Christ. We serve a Jesus that died for our sins on the cross, gives us everlasting life. You know how blessed we are. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, it says, Jesus was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities, and we are all healed by his stripes. When Jesus Christ went to that cross and died for us, we oftentimes picture him there on that cross, but do you understand the agony and the pain the suffering that he went through being beaten with those wall balls on that middle of that tip of that whip in order to soften his flesh up for the Roman kind of nine tails? That's the whip that had the little pieces of bone and claw on that. And so what happened is when they would whip someone with that, it would literally tear their skin from their body and their flesh. And it is said that those who executed that would be so great at what they do, they would take a person within an inch of their life. Organs would be showing through their back. And Christ endured all that for you and I. 
Christ endured all that as he died there in agony and pain and suffering and shame there between two thieves so you and I can come to God's house on God's day and have joy in our heart because he says, I know I come to give you life. I have came to give you life more abundantly. That's the Jesus we serve. And that's how the joy we're to have in our heart when we gather in God's house. Let me tell you something. No Democrat would have done that for you. No Republican would have done that for you. No professional athlete would have done that for you. Jesus did that for you. That's why we're, it's a blessing that he died. It's good news that he died. It's also good news that he buried him. Look what the Bible says there in verse 4. It says, and then he was buried. And he rose again on that third day according to the scriptures. Why is it important that they buried him? Well, that proves that he didn't faint. It proves that he didn't pass out. It proves that he actually died. There's something about seeing Christ dead that changes lives. There was two secret disciples of Jesus, if you remember. One of them was Joseph of Arimathea. The other one was Nicodemus that came to Christ at night. Both of those individuals came out of the woodwork the moment Christ died. Now, what's fascinating about that is, is where were they at during his ministry? Where was Joseph of Arimathea at during Jesus' ministry? I mean, it's not like they didn't see his miracles. It's not like they didn't hear his messages. It's not like they didn't see the injustices that he was going through by that falsely of a, of a, of a trial that he went through. But what changed them? Seeing him die. What changed them? You see, part of salvation is someone is that we serve a Savior who died. For you and I. It changes. I'm all about preaching hell, fire, and brimstone. I believe that hell is a real place. I don't think that it's some place where you're going to go hang out with your buddies at the bar and listen to Hank Williams Jr. on the jukebox until the early morning hours. That's not what hell is. I believe that hell is a place of total darkness where there's pain and gnashing of teeth, where the Bible says the fire has never ceased and the worm never dies. I believe it is a place of torment for all of eternity, and we should shun from it. But I'm here to tell you tonight is you don't go to heaven just because you're scared to go to hell. You go to heaven because you understand the love of Christ dying for you on that cross. When Joseph of Arimathea, when Nicodemus seen what Jesus was willing to do for them that they could have done, he says, I will give my life to you. I'll give my all to you because only Jesus, only you died for me. No one else would have done that for me and it sets us free because salvation's not based on emotions. What I'm about to tell you, please don't get offended. I want you to know that no dogs was harmed in my illustration, okay? So please don't get worked up over this. Have you ever stayed up late at night and, and, and info commercial come on TV? And, you know, you're laying there and you're thinking, man, I need to get up and turn TV off or whatever. But you sit there and keep watching it. And what's the one info commercial you see often is the one with Suzanne Summers and the dogs, right? The dogs are abused. The dogs are neglected. Well, listen, I got a buddy at home. Buddy's my, I would mortgage my house if buddy needed bed bills, okay? I love my dog death, so I'm not trying to talk bad about dogs. But, but I'm just trying to emphasize something to you. There's those dogs on TV. And there's Susan Summers. And what is she doing? She's pleading with us, right? 50 cents a day, man. That's all that it takes. 50 cents a day, and you can change a dog's life. Don't really move you that much. But what does move you? Willie Nelson moves you, don't he? Something about Willie Nelson singing, right? I don't know what it is, but Willie Nelson starts singing in the background. You was always on my mind. I'll do a special tomorrow night. Yeah. But when Willie Nelson, when he starts singing, the hairs on your arms stand up, don't they, man? I mean, the, 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 the tails begin tingling on the back of your neck, man, and you get teary-eyed, and you start thinking to yourself, we can afford 50 cents a day. I mean, it's not that much money. We just won't give the kid no lunch money. I mean, we can do this. We can pull this off. And you get all the way to the phone, and, you, and, you, and you're going to pick it up. But then the commercial goes off, and Suzanne gone, and Willie, he ain't singing no more. And you put the phone back down. And you know why? Because you was being moved with emotions, right? Salvation is not based on just emotion. Salvation is based on relationship. I never will forget Brother Ronnie Angel did a revival for us at Lesby's Mill years and years and years ago. But at the end of the revival, he stood right down there and he said, I'm not begging you to do what God's already telling you to do. I could stand here tonight and we can see just as I am until you're blue in the face. That does not save you. I've been to churches before where the pastors will tell you you're going to die in five car wrecks by the time you get home if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Well, listen, 
That doesn't save you. Until you see a dead Savior who is willing to take your penalty and consequences for your sin upon himself and die for you on that cross, you'll never be saved. It's our salvation of sin, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. It's good news that he died. It's good news that he was buried. And it's also good news because he lives. Amen. Look what the Bible says in verse 4. It says, And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is that ver- the hymn that we sing? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lived, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living. Just because he lives. He lives. The only aim, he lives. You know why I know he lives? Because he lives within my heart. That's how I know he lives. He's in my heart. Now, why is it I can stand on my pulpit on Sunday morning and I can preach? He lives. He lives, church. Oh, the Holy God, he lives. And you all some be saying, preacher, you need to be wrapping this up because if we're going to get to the Cracker Barrel before Joey's church gets there because they're already... <laughs> They're already closer to us, and Joey ain't half as long-winded as you are, and we're in a hurry. Why don't it change us? Why don't it move us? I could stand up here tonight, and I could pull rabbits out of this vest. Do magic trick. It's rabbit after rabbit after rabbit. You'd be like, wow, man. And you, you go home, and you go to work tomorrow. You tell everybody that preacher at, at that church last night, he pulled rabbits out of his vest while he was preaching. Isn't that astonishing? Be, man, I got to go and see him preach sometime. That's amazing. I could stand up here tonight, and I could juggle him, right? Just, just juggle him the whole time while I'm preaching and keep a train of thought. You'd be like, I've never seen nobody juggle hymnals and preach at the exact same time. That's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. But if I stand here and I say, Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. We don't get as excited. We don't get emotional up. And why? Because I think about it. You realize this, that when Christ was in that tomb after he died, you think about that blind man that put the mud in his eyes and he came seen. I guarantee he called his family over and he said, let me look at you one more time. Let me look at your face because my Savior died and guess what? I might lose my eyesight tomorrow morning. I don't know how much longer I'm going to have it. Or maybe that person who had leprosy, but Jesus had clean and saw all the leprosy gone. He should probably said, let me hug you. Let me kiss on you. Let me touch you for one last time because I may not be able to do that when this leprosy comes back because Jesus died. My Savior died. Praise God on that third day he rose again and he conquered that death, hell, and that grave. And he gives us that everlasting life and he gives us the hope that which we hold on to because he conquered the devil. He conquered our adversary. All he is, all he is, is a, is a, is a, is a, a, I've got a brain freeze. All he is is this troublemaker that wants to cause trouble, but he can't do anything to us. The greatest example or uh, illustration I ever heard about the devil was this one. I stole it from another preacher. Preachers do that a lot, by the way. We steal stuff from other preachers and use it as our own, just so you know. But I, but I heard a preacher say this one time. A father and his son was in the car together, driving down the road. And there was a bumblebee in the car. And the bumblebee starts swirling around, swirling around. And the little boy gets scared in the back seat. He said, Daddy, Daddy, there's a bumblebee in the car. And all of a sudden, that bumblebee landed on the daddy's arm and stung him. And the father, you know, he kind of jerked a little bit, and he swooshed him like that, just swooshed him off of him. But the bumblebee was still alive, and he was still flying around the car, and the little boy was still crying, saying, Daddy, Daddy, he's going to sting me. And the, and the father said, Son, don't worry. That bumblebee, you see, when he stung me, he lost his stinger. He got no stinger no more. All he can do is aggravate you. All he can do is bother you, but he cannot hurt you. And that's the devil. You see, when Jesus Christ stepped forth out of that grave, he pulled that stinger straight off the old devil, and he can do nothing to us any longer. Jesus set us free. He took that cost, that penalty on that cross. He did that for us. That's the good news. And lastly, it's good news because Christ is coming again. Look what the Bible says in verse 51. I didn't read this in our text, but go on over there into that. It says there, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all be changed in a moment. In the twinkle of an eye, at that last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, then so which this corruptible shall have put on this incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying that death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy strength? And death, where is thy victory? Because our victory is in who? It's in Jesus Christ. That's our victory. We won the victory because of Jesus. Grace 
is a gift that God gives us we do not deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. You know what I didn't deserve? God's forgiveness, but he forgave me. You know what I did deserve? Death, hell, and the grave. But you know what he gave me instead? He gave me everlasting life because I trusted in him. That's salvation. And you may be here tonight, and you need Jesus in your heart. You need to accept Christ first and foremost. And you know, you're thinking to yourself, well, preacher, you don't understand what all I've done. My wife won't speak to me. My husband won't speak to me. My mom, my dad, they've disowned me. My children, they won't talk to me. I've done all these terrible things in my life. Look what our text said over there in verse 9 that the Apostle Paul said. He said, for I am the least of the apostles. I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Paul said, I'm a nobody. He said, I used to persecute the church. He said, when Stephen was stoned to death, I held their garments while they picked up stones and killed him. I used to go around and lock Christians up. That's what I did. I don't even deserve, but I love that next verse where he says there in that text, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace was bestowed upon me. That's that gift that God gives us we don't deserve. And I'm telling you tonight, Jesus wants to give it to you. He wants to save you. I'm a nobody. You all love me. I don't know why. I've had so many of you come up to me tonight and tell me, you know, remember me when I was this tall and, and growing up. Most of you remember me as Paul Curtis. You know, I used to be Paul Curtis growing up, and uh, you know me as Paul Curtis. I've been loved by more than I deserve. I've been encouraged by more than I deserve, and most of you are here tonight that's loved me and encouraged me. Am I perfect? Absolutely. And you know what I am? I'm a sinner saved by grace. I don't deserve to stand behind this pulpit no more than anyone else. I, I, I've done things in my life I'm ashamed of, but you know something? I'm forgiven for it. I stand behind this pulpit. I'm not educated. I, I was on a, 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 a panel two Sundays ago for the associational meeting over in Shelby County, and they had me and four other pastors on this panel. And it was very good, very interesting. I did enjoy doing it. But the purpose of sitting on that panel was is you as church folk could come and ask us preachers anything you want to ask us, anything at all. Why we do this in church, well, how we done this, whatever it is, and we pastors, we answered it. And I guess I enjoyed it. I thought it was good that we did. But as I was sitting up there, one of the questions that came from the crowd was, is what is your all's education? And so, like I said, there was four others, and they started down there, and the first guy said, well, I graduated from Bible college, and the second one says, I got a, I got a master's in divinity. The third one said, I got a doctorate degree. I said, ooh, wow, doctorate degree. If I'm lying, I'm dying. The dude beside me had two doctorate degrees. Two. I, like, looked at him like, two? <laughs> what do you want two for? I don't know. I mean, I, I'll take one if you don't want it, but whatever. But he had two. And they got to me. And you know what I told them? I told them the truth. I said, I was the smartest kid in third grade for two years. <laughs> That's what I am. Truth of the matter is, I was not the smartest kid in third grade for two years. I did pass third grade. You know why I passed third grade? Because my mother made homemade bread for the teacher. That's why I passed third grade. <laughs> and you all in here, some of you all in here know that's absolutely the truth. You know that's the truth. That's, that's who I am. But you know something, I may not have no degree on my wall, and I may not be nobody, but I know somebody who is somebody, and I got Jesus in my heart. <laughs> and he died for my sins on that cross. And I'm here to tell you, he died for you, to save you right here and right now. You don't save yourself. Salvation is not a wage you earn, man. It is a gift from God, and he wants to give it to you right now. You may be here tonight, and you need to rededicate your life. You need to turn a burden over. You need to lay that into the altar of the Lord and say, God, you take it over. Do that this evening. We're going to have an invitation after I pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, to worship you, to, to hear the word, to hear the gospel, Lord. It sets us free. And I pray that, Lord, you will take my inadequacies, that you'll take my failures, my shortcomings, and, Lord, that you'll give the word, you'll give the power of the Spirit, and, Lord, you'll change hearts and lives unto repentance, unto salvation, unto rededication. Lord, there may be someone here that needs to become a member of Franklin Baptist Church or a member of Union Baptist Church or a member of Lockport Baptist Church. Lord, they've heard our messages so much. They know Brother Jack, they know Brother Joey, they know me. Lord, there's nothing new we're going to do or say. They just need to get right. They need to get involved. And I pray the Lord tonight in this revival 
that they'll walk down and they'll take their pastor by their hand and they'll say, I want to become a member of our church and I want to grow in this church. Lord, let this be a revival that gives you all the glory. That's all I ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you stand? Our hymn of invitation is going to be a 320, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? The light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting we passed and we follow him there over sin or hath dominion and more conquers we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of last verse. His